Okay, welcome to another session of CAST. CAST is Christ Alone Solves Troubles. Recognizing that uh, you have a lot of trouble in your life, you got a lot of pain in your life, you got a lot of darkness in your life, you are defeated, you feel you're depressed, you're despondent, um, you're despairing, you're in a dark place. Those things can happen. They can happen for a variety of reasons and they can happen to people on and off, but sometimes people get into those situations and are there for a long time and do not seem to be able to find any release, any hope, any help out. I'm hoping to give you some help out. And it's, it's vested in the idea that Christ alone solves troubles, it's in Christ. So I mean, you think about the life of Jesus, uh, he raised people from the dead, he healed lepers, he stal calmed storms, he um, fed uh, thousands out of little, uh, he healed the deaf and the blind. Uh, he just uh, touched people in, in a myriad of ways. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that you have a miraculous, which means a, an instantaneous, completely well healing kind of a thing. But I'm suggesting that he will give you the hope and the help and take you through a process of getting you to the other side, getting you to the light, getting you out of the dark. Uh, I'm reminded that Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. God sees the big picture. You see a sliver, you see a slice, you see you in time and space. God sees your neighbor. God sees the people uh, around you. He sees the generations behind you, what's come ahead, what was before you. Uh, he sees what's behind the veil, uh, the demonic activities. Uh, he sees the eternal aspect of it, the uh, forever part of it. All those things go into the process of his thinking and his doings. And so when we come to him, we ask the Lord for a healing, an instantaneous healing. Uh, we want it done this way and in this timing. Um, you know, I think we can ask the Lord of those things. You know, in the first few of these, I gave you some prayers in Scripture where people are crying out to God for, for help, for healing, for transformation now. Um, and we can ask that. But we should not demand that. Remember Jesus in the garden when he is about to be arrested and about to be brutally, brutally uh, battered in body and then impaled on a cross to die a horrific death. He cries out to the Father, is there any other way, is there any other way, is there any other way? And you can cry out to the Father, but you should come back to this resolve. Not my will, but yours be done. And uh, again, God's a good father. God's a, a loving God. He's a good shepherd. He's not about your demise, but he is about the eternal things. He's about your betterment. He's also about reaching your neighbor, the kids behind you, uh, the, 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 a broader spectrum than you and I uh, see. So again, the, the Christ alone solves troubles in his way, in his timing, but trust me, he can do that. But for the day, he can give you hope, he can give you help, uh, he can bring healing, um, it may be, may be quickened, it may be slow yet, <clears throat> and sometimes he does not heal. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12. So we we got to trust that God will, uh, will, will carry you and will help you and will hold you and will get you to out of the storm to, to a firm footing to the shore. <laughs> So um, we're, we're talking about uh, casting all your care upon him. That's the cast idea, which is uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting your care upon him, for he cares for you. So I just want to give you a verse here, and then we'll give you a story about uh, God's um, ability and God's uh, workings that you might find hope in that. Um, the verse I want to give you is uh, John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, that's, that's the first verse of a chapter, but it really is a continuation of chapter 13. Peter says to the Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot go or follow, but you will follow me afterward. Well, I'm going to the cross to die for people, but he says, you will die in time. And actually, Peter does die even on a cross in Rome uh, some years later. But Peter says, verse 37 of chapter 13, John 13, 37, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Oh boy. Jesus said, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you, the rooster shall not rooster shall not crow until you deny me three times. You're gonna fail. You're going to greatly fail. 
Peter says, I can do this. I'm going to be right there with you. I will go to, the, 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 to my death for you. Jesus says, no, you will fail. And so, I mean, again, boy, just uh, bold and, and brash, but not able to follow through. And then when Jesus makes this statement, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he goes, in my father's house are many mansions. And when I saw I've told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So here's, here's the situation. God says, you're going to fail. You're going to fail greatly. You're going to have a real, real dark time in your life. You're going to have a real loss in your life. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So I would say that to you, whatever situation you're in, believe in God, believe in him. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now that's for those who are his followers. That's not just for mankind in a, in a broad sweep. That's for anybody who's placed their trust, their faith in Jesus. Are you a follower of Jesus? He says, if that's the case, you may have a dark time. You may have a time where of, of despair. Uh, Peter greatly failed. I mean, he went out and wept bitterly. Uh, he uh, he dis despaired of life. He had failed his, his master. He was a liar. And he was um, uh, a weakling. All those things just came sweeping in on him. But Jesus said to him, let not your heart be troubled. You believe. Believe in God. Believe in me. I prepare a place for you. So there's hope. There's help coming. There's hope. There's help coming. And in essence, that's the message I want to do, uh, leave with you from that verse. There's hope and there's help coming. Trust in the Lord. Now, I'm going to give you a story again. And this one is from uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 6. Again, an impossible situation, uh, a, a, a place where people have no way out. There is no solution. There's no help horizontally, but God, but God vertically. So I'm in... Um, 2 Kings chapter 6, and it says in verse 24, <clears throat> 2 Kings 6, 24, that after this, uh, Ben-Hadad, ben -Had, ben the, the king of Syria, gathered his army and went up and besieged Samaria. Samaria is the capital of the northern ten tribes. Uh, it's north of Jerusalem, uh, 30, 40 miles. And it's the capital, so this army of Assyria, Assyrian army, Damascus, comes in circles. And there was great famine. And they besieged it until a donkey's head sold for a, day, a, a year's wages. A donkey head. You know, why, why you want a donkey head? Something to eat. You know, the eyes, the brains, the tongue, the cheeks, the, the cheek meat. I, you know, my goodness. And you, you would even be willing to pay even a week's wages for dove doo-doo, for dove poop. He says, um, and, 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 and a fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. I mean, it's, it's desperate. It's terrible. They're surrounded by an army. There's no way out. There's no escape. They're, they're taken captive, and they are desperate. And as the king of Israel was passing on the wall, a woman cried out to him, Help, O Lord, my king. He said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find? How can I help you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press. I mean, I, I don't have any food. I don't, there's no wheat. There's no grapes. I, how can I help you? If God's not helping you, how am I going to help you? What's your trouble? Verse 28, she said, well, this woman said to me, give me your son that we may eat him today and we'll eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and we ate him. And I said to her the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. And it happened when the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes, he passed by the wall, the people looked and underneath he had sackcloth on. And he says, God do so to me and more so if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. It's God's fault. It's God's prophet's fault. It's Elisha's fault. This terrible, terrible thing has happened. Well, you may be in a terrible situation, and you maybe have had thoughts about that. Well, God, it's God's fault. God's caused it. God is evil. God is indifferent. God is unable. God is distant. God is distracted. I mean, whatever. You know, and, and so what, what's the response for the king here? Blame God. And blame God's people. Well, that can happen, and, and you, we, we even see, uh, you see that oftentimes in Scripture, but don't stay there. Please don't stay there. Uh, realize that for God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for rotten sinners like you and like I. Uh, okay, there's a love side of God. So God allows things. He allows, he limits, and he uses. Those are my three ideas about evil, Satan. He allows him. He limits him, Job chapter 1 and 2. <clears throat> He uses him. Um, Satan, Jesus to the cross, but it's God's plan all along. 
So uh, you may accuse God. There, here the king says, "I'm going to kill Elisha. I'm going to cut his head off. If they, if he, if he's not dead with his head gone in 24 hours, uh, it won't be because I didn't try." Okay, terrible situation. There, there, there's no escape. Uh, I'm dropping down to verse 33, <clears throat> chapter 6, verse 33, the middle of it. The king said, This calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? I'm not going to trust God anymore. Why should I wait for the Lord any, any longer? Elijah said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall so be sold for a shekel, two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. A, a, a 24 hours from now, business is going to be like back to normal. You're going to be able to buy bread like a dollar, or you're going to be able to buy a bag of flour for two dollars like you did before all this happened. The officer, the representative for the king, answered the man of God, said, look, if the Lord would make windows of heaven, open up heaven and just dump out bread from heaven, just dump out flour from heaven. He says, that could, how could that be? How can that be? There's no way that in 24 hours things can be back to normal. And, and, and he says, uh, Elisha says to him, in fact, you will see it but you will not eat it. So what happened in that, this guy, when the, when this does all happen, the people are rushing out the gate to go get the plunder, go get the food from the abandoned enemy camp that's coming in, in these next verses. This guy's standing in the gate and he gets trampled to death. So yeah, he does see of it, know of it, but he doesn't partake in it. Okay, so now there are four leprous men, I'm in chapter 7, verse 3, at the gate and they said to one another, why are we still sitting here till we die? If we enter the city, we're going to die. If we go out there, we may die, but you never know. He says, uh, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we'll live. If they kill us, well, okay, we're going to die here. Well, let's go. So they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, and when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord, here it is, for the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots, the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said, the Syrian army said, go on and look. The king of Assyria has hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, they arose, they fled at twilight, they left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys. They fled for their lives. God caused them to hear, and they escaped by the skin of their teeth, leaving behind their equipment, leaving behind their horses, leaving behind all their provisions, all their food, everything. Their camp was intact. They were gone. So the lepers go out to eat a little bit, and they said this in right. So they go back in and tell the people in the city. So the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I'm going to tell you what's up. I'm going to tell you what the Assyrians have done to us. This is verse 12. They know that we're hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field. It's an ambush. They're going to draw us out. Then they're going to kill us. When they come out of the city, when we come out of the city, we shall be caught alive, and then they will get in the city. And one of the servants said, please, let several of the men take the five remaining horses that are left in the city. Look, that, that they may either become like all the multitude of Israel, I mean, go out there and be killed, or, 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 or let us send and see. Therefore, they took two chariots with the horses, and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army. Go see. And when they went after them to the Jordan, indeed, all the road was full of garments and weapons, which the Assyrians had thrown down in their haste, so the messengers returned and told the king. So from the capital down, dropping down to the Jordan, it's just littered with helmets and debris and swords and cloaks and uh, bags. And as they're fleeing, so they're gone. Well, uh, so what, what Elisha said, in 24 hours, you're going to have food, things are going to be back to normal, and it's going to be... Uh, back to life as it was. And so here's an impossible situation that God brought a victory by, by a sound. He scared them off. And he scared them off to the point they had no time to gather up their horses and their donkeys and their provisions. They left them all for the people of Samaria. So here's your, your dilemma, your situation. You're, you're, you're trapped. You're a captive. You're surrounded. Uh, you're desperate. You are uh, feigning even living. But God can scare the enemy away. I, what, what is the enemy? I mean, the enemy can be people. The enemy can be certain circumstances, a boss. Uh, the enemy can be cancer. Uh, the enemy can be uh, all kinds of things. God is able. Christ alone solves troubles. Cast your care on him. He cares for you. There's nothing too hard. There's nothing impossible. There's nothing that God cannot bring you out of and bring you through to a good place. Again, it may take time. It, again, it may not happen immediately, and it may not happen the way you want it to happen. But over and again, God says, trust me, 
trust me, I can bring about the victory. I can bring about goodness. I can bring about uh, a worth in all of this. I mean, look at the cross. Did he bring about victory? Did he bring about worth? Well, yeah, after Jesus died, was buried, but he rose. But then what happened? Paul says in Galatians 6, we glory in the cross. God says, I can take your situation, impossible as it is, and I can turn it into a positive situation, something that is a blessing to you, blessing to others, blessing even to me, says the Lord. So, here's another story. Impossible? Mm, yeah, this way, but not impossible because of him. So look to God, lean on God, trust God, allow God to, to have his will, his way in your life, and watch God work. Father, I pray that this person uh, watching this will uh, just commit themselves afresh to you. And maybe they've never been saved. Maybe they need it for the first time, bow their knee, and say, Father, please, I'm a sinner. Would you please accept me? Would you, would you allow, um, would, you, would you work in my life? Would you come to lead me and guide me? I, I want to follow you. I want to be yours. And if they are yours, Father, that they would uh, come and say, your will be done. Your timing be done. Your way be done. I, I, I submit to you, but Lord, I pray you give me hope. Give me help. Give me strength. Give me um, uh, the, the strength for the next steps. And so, Lord, I pray that this person, whatever the situation they're in, will make those steps and find you leading them out of the deepness that they find themselves in. To your glory, to their good, and to the good of the people around them, we pray that you would do this work. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, next time.